Let's get joined up. Today's show is brought to you by Audible, and right now you can get a free audiobook download and 30 day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash joined up. There's over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. So thanks for tuning in to the Joined Up Writing Podcast, a regular show about all things writing, including interviews with authors, screenwriters, and key figures from the publishing industry, plus loads of hints, tips, and inspiration for all kinds of creatives. You can follow us on Twitter at JU Podcast, leave a quick iTunes review, or just tell a friend. Right, cue that cheesy theme tune. Put down your pen and stop your typing Grab yourself a drink cause it's joined up writing Hello and welcome to the Joined Up Writing Podcast, where a little procrastination can go a long way. I'm Wayne Kelly and it's episode 98, featuring an interview with Hannah Jameson, author of the excellent dystopian thriller The Last. Me and Hannah talked about everything from her approach to writing, why she loves first-person POV, and why she thinks it's best to eat dessert first. That'll all make sense a little bit later. Before that, a little catch-up from me. I've been working away all of this week, and uh, when I say working away, I don't mean working working away as in working away on all of my projects I mean my day job has taken me away from home all of this week and despite all of my good intentions to make time to write something in the evenings in my hotel room I just haven't found the energy or the inclination and I've been doing the socializing thing that you do when you're away as well with other people Um, so I really haven't got anything done and it's not that I had loads of time to waste but to be brutally honest I suppose I could have found a spare half an hour at night to try and get some words down and I just didn't. Now yes a big part of that is that I'm still trying to shake off the post Christmas malaise but you know we are nearly in February but I think another factor has been a real lack of focus. So despite having started the follow-up to my crime novel, Safe Hands, I've also been consumed by the idea of writing a screenplay or radio script. In fact, I've been reading loads of TV and film scripts and I'm feeling really inspired. And that's good, you'd think. But like most of you out there, I don't have an unlimited free time, amount of free time to spend on writing. So, uh, for example, I also need to get back to work on the non-fiction book I intend to release later in the year. A large proportion of that has been written, but there's still work to be done and me and my collaborator, Maria Smith, need to complete the first draft, begin the edit and put together our marketing plan and release schedule. So like all of these projects, it won't write itself, but at the same time, I don't want to abandon all of my fiction and screenwriting ideas for the duration of a non-fiction project. So if I'm going to be productive, you know, I think that I really do need to settle on one thing at a time or at least plan in specific writing sessions for specific writing goals. Um, and when I'm only working on one project, for example, when I really got my head down on safe hands, I just find it a bit more straightforward. I, um, I try to do something on it every day and I know that every time I sit down it's to work on that. And editing in particular with that project was great because you know there's kind of a built-in structure on how I needed to tackle the work. Now, I know there's an argument for saying, well, just focus on one thing at a time until it's finished and stop moaning, but I don't particularly enjoy that, especially when one of those projects is non-fiction. The variety kind of works well for me, being able to go from non-fiction to to fiction. However, for screenwriting, I am going to need to settle down on a single idea, decide on the medium and the format and structure it properly, because in my experience, scripts are not something you can write by the seat of your pants, but... Anyway, what about you guys? How do you find working on multiple projects or in different genres? How do you plan your writing time and decide what to work on? I'd love to hear from you, so drop me a line at wayne at waynekellywrites.com or tweet me at jupodcast and I'll give you a mention in a future show. Anyway, screenwriting is something else that pops up in today's chat with Hannah Jameson, so I think it's time you stop listening to me drone on about my problems and we got to today's interview. So Hannah Jameson was listed for the CWA John Creasy Dagger Award 2013 for her debut novel, Something You Are, 
Girl 7, the second novel in her London Underground series, was published in April 2014, and a third, Roadkill, was published in 2016, all to critical acclaim. Now, Hannah's latest book, The Last, is a high-concept thriller set in a remote hotel, and it's released on January 31st, 2019 this year. Available from everywhere you can get books. So enjoy the chat, and I'll be back a little bit later to remind you how you can get your hands on more free bonus content. Okay, Hannah, thanks a million for coming on Joined Up Writing Podcast. Really appreciate it. Uh, so, yeah, how's things been going? You, you just mentioned off air there that uh, you're trying to shake off the post-Christmas kind of uh, lull that we get into. So uh, how's things in general? Uh, yeah, pretty good. Um, I always wildly overestimate how much work I'm going to get done over the Christmas break, uh, yeah, which always too. ends up being nothing. Uh-huh. But I told myself I was going to finish an episode, I was going to start a book, and then I did nothing but compete in a sort of, you know, food champagne (laughs) event. Um, So, yeah, I've just been trying to get back into the swing of actually getting up and doing something other than just eating all day. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, I've been writing all day today and eating at normal times, which is a big improvement. Yeah, it's good. I know exactly what you mean about the Christmas thing. I mean, I mentioned exactly the same thing in the last... Last podcast intro, actually, I had the same thing. It's when I was breaking up for work and I had sort of got almost two weeks off and I wrote a list of things I was going to do and catch up on. And then when it came down to it, after the busy time at work, it just sort of everything just screeches to a halt and you just yeah. think, yeah, I'll just catch up on all my TV is what I'm actually going to do and eat lots of food, like you say, and drink. Yeah. But but anyway, we need breaks as well. We need, you know, all creatives need uh, to relax as well. We need downtime, don't we, so? I guess so, but then every time I take a break, I just end up wishing I'd never taken one because the process of sort of learning how to write again, especially mm. habitually after some time off, is just wretched. Um, I think, it, yeah, I, I agree. I think it's a little bit like running or something like that because when, when I used to, I mean, I don't run at the moment, but when I used to run, it was the same thing. It's once you get into a habit of it, it's kind of, is something that you do and it's relatively not easy but you know it's easy to slip back into it but if you go sort of one or two weeks and you haven't ran just the thought of going for that first run is <laughs> is bad enough let alone doing it yeah no it's a, yeah it's a good analogy actually because I've also been delaying going to the gym for the past two <laughs> there you weeks go, yeah. <laughs> and I've gone through that horrific process <laughs> oh so you've got um, that to look forward to as well yeah, yeah, it's been, oh, January's tough. I don't know why people give up drinking during it. <laughs> no, I completely agree. I won't be doing that. <laughs> uh, okay, well, anyway, so that's us caught up. But why don't you, before we get into you telling us a little bit more about your writing and that kind of thing, why don't you tell us about your latest novel, the novel that's just about to come out, The, the Last, which I've just finished literally today as I was, I flo- flew back from Glasgow really, really early this morning. As, and as the wheels hit the tarmac, I finished the last page of your book and I loved it. So why don't you tell oh, us a little bit about that? Um, sure. Well, um, I wrote it uh, early, God, is it early 2017 now? It's been that long. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been a bigger run up to publication. Uh, but it's basically a um, post-apocalyptic uh, murder mystery uh, narrated by an American academic who's stranded in a Swiss hotel uh, during the initial months of nuclear war. And uh, that's, I mean, that's probably the best way I can describe it in a sentence. That's a good setup, yeah. Yeah. And and so it's, it's obviously, it deals with its big themes. It's kind of a, it's, it's high concept because as you say, it's kind of told from a kind of first person almost journal well it's kind of like a journal isn't it um kind of format that you've taken so you know where did the idea come from initially what made you want to write this it does feel kind of really current with kind of what's going on and people's general kind of fears I think in the world at the moment so what kind of spurred you to write it um well, uh, mostly because I was uh, going to run out of money. <laughs> that would be the material context. It's literally the end of the world. <laughs> yeah, which which inspired me to write that book. Uh, because if I didn't, uh, then I had nothing to sell. And uh, I would uh, I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't have a plan B, helpfully. So uh, panic was a big motivator. <laughs> um, as for what inspired the actual subject matter, um it was from a lot of places, but I mean, it, it's unavoidable uh, talking about the political mm-hmm. context. Um, it was written sort of immediately after the 2016 US presidential election, which mm-hmm. I think left everyone with a kind of 
uh, news-based PTSD. <laughs> yeah. um, and I think everyone is still kind of dealing with the fallout of that somehow. Uh-huh. Um, but the way I dealt with it was um, channeling all of that fear and despair and uh, sort of sadness really into something constructive. Um, and uh, people sort of hear the premise of The Last, and yes, it is set post-apocalypse and it's set post-nuclear war, but I think ultimately it's a much more optimistic novel than me. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, I, and and I want to talk about the novel a little bit more in detail a little bit later on, but yeah, I don't want people to... Uh, be listening to this thinking oh it's really really depressing or anything like that it's not like you know the road or something like that it is god no (laughs) you know i didn't i didn't want to run a warm bath at the end of it no it was it was it is it's really it's a page turning kind of thriller is is the kind of feel of it it's kind of how i felt when i was uh when i was reading it so uh no i mean obviously it's quite it's got some really kind of heavy themes in it and really thought-provoking ethical dilemmas and things which i'll probably talk to you a little bit about uh, a bit later so so before we um go into a little bit more detail about that let's go back a little bit so tell me a little bit about yourself what's your kind of background and what's your what's your earliest memory of writing something and, and how did you get into writing in the first place oh god my earliest memory of writing um it's probably it's it's going to be really early it was six or seven um, and I was asked to write a story uh, when I was in primary school and I wrote a story about a uh, oh it's <laughs> sorry, just remembering it it was a story um, about a uh, a puppy or a dog who um, kept returning to the same uh, clearing in a woods every day to watch the flowers and all of all of the plants growing and it it was a really kind of uh, you know the beauty of the cycle of oh, life that's nice uh, yeah kind of story oh how everything has changed <laughs> <laughs> the innocence but, uh, of youth yeah basically um that that's probably my earliest memory but i did always know i wanted to be an author um and i suppose i'm just fortunate that no one told me that was a really ridiculous idea um, and that, that that's not a normal thing that you can just decide to be and take a degree in, like becoming a, a police officer or a medical student or something else much more impressive. Um, so, yeah, I just kind of followed that my entire life. Um, and it probably wasn't until my early 20s that I realized quite how difficult and outlandish an idea it was i always just thought it was what i was going to be and it was going to be my career mm-hmm. and um no one contradicted me yeah but so, i think i think that's great though because i think you know i know you're kind of being a bit cavalier about it and a bit modest but i think <laughs> it's you know i mean i can remember really clearly when i was at uh, i would have been about 15 and sitting down with the careers advisors i don't know whether they even have those anymore um before the internet and everything else um oh, but good. but but you would say well i i sort of said well you know i'm interested in in doing something to do with writing and it, you know a lot of people think well okay they immediately go to journalism you know that's kind of the they, they think well that's kind of a way and it's kind of a formal more formalized route so i said about that and the careers advisor said, oh, that's very difficult to get into. <laughs> and, you know, she sort of immediately <laughs> tried to put me off it. So I do, I think you're right. I think, I think ignorance is, is a powerful thing. Um, you know, and that kind of, uh, it can be when you're younger. I think it can be. I think if, like you say, nobody told you you couldn't do it. So you just went off and, and you did it. Yeah. And I suppose by the time I was the age that, that people started advising me against it, um, there was a tu- uh, one tutor in particular at college. And it, it was around the kind of same careers advice level of my life, like second year or something. Um, and we had a talk about what I was going to do. And I, I told him without any reservations that I wasn't going on to university. Um, and I was a, a straight A student and he was horrified. And he gave me this look like I was just deranged. <laughs> And he said very quietly, um, look, Hannah, I'm sure you're a good writer, but, you know, you're going to have to be a little bit more realistic about your prospects. Mm -hmm. And and I was so affronted that made me want to do it even more. Yeah. Um, And I thought, God, you know what, when I sell my first book, I'm going to come back and like, I don't know, just just do something really cool. (laughs) <laughs> um nonchalant but just just make it really clear that i had made a success of myself and i was gonna prove him wrong uh but then i forgot about it because uh 
Well, you go. I couldn't, I couldn't think of an appropriately cool <laughs> way to do it. <laughs> he'd have probably been really happy for you. That's right. And he probably would have said, "Well, yeah, my plan worked. You know, it it spurred you into action." So, oh, yeah, he would have done. He'd have been able to claim it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was like reverse engineered it. So it's it's fine. Um, so, and you say about that, and and you were very young, weren't you? When you, well, when you, when did you write your first novel, or what you'd class as your first novel? Um, and it might I, not be the one that got published, but the one that you kind of finished, and you thought, well, this is a novel. Oh, okay. My first novel that I finished, I wrote when I was fifteen. Um, it was. It's still an idea that I'd like to use, to be honest, because mm-hmm. the bare bones are quite good. Um, but it was like a, it was like an espionage slash gangland thriller. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I didn't do anything with it. I think because I knew it actually just wasn't good enough mm-hmm. because I was 15. Yeah. Um, and then I started writing another one when I was 17 and that was the book that turned into something you are, which was published when I was 21. Um, but yeah, I, I finished my first novel quite, quite early. I think just because I was really, I was just business-like about it. I, I knew what I had to do and I knew what I had to teach myself to do. And I had no life when I was at secondary school anyway, because I was a, a nerd and no one wanted to date me or invite me to parties. <laughs> so you had so, lots of time on your hands. Yeah. So I thought, God, everyone would want to date me and invite me to parties when I'm famous. <laughs> it's good thinking. It's like why people join <laughs> bands. It's why people write books. It's, it, it's yeah. yeah. Out of spite exactly yeah so you were so you were 21 when you uh you finished what would become your first published book and i think uh i'm right in saying so you got you managed to get like a four book deal when you were like 22 is that right um yeah it was it was a three book deal and i I was 21 right um that's still pretty impressive though i I was pretty happy about it yeah I, i didn't um then kind of know much about contracts or money or how things work so it's weird because you want something your whole life and then when you get it you think oh i probably wouldn't do that next time but Mm -hmm. now i know um i probably wouldn't go into a three book deal Mm -hmm. again that's interesting why what what makes you say that creatively um it was i felt quite creatively constricted by the end of it and um also because it's so hard to make a living wage Mm -hmm. um in you know in writing and in Mm -hmm. publishing Mm-hmm. Um, I, I found myself having to produce a, a book a year, mm-hmm. which is almost impossible to do when you're also trying to pay rent and bills because yeah. you're not being paid enough to pay your rent and bills. Yeah. So um, whenever I give uh, creative writing lectures or workshops or anything like that, I always give students a kind of rundown of the jobs I've had mm-hmm. since being published and while being in a three book deal. Mm-hmm. And it was waitressing, I was bartending, I had a corporate job, um, you know, because yeah. I had to do that to live. Yeah. Um, and they're always very surprised by that. Yeah, I think. Yeah, but it is it is a recurring theme. I mean, with with I mean, I've spoken to dozens and dozens of authors for this um, podcast, and you know, so many people. And I mean, it doesn't always come up because I think, and I have had this conversation with other people before. But there is almost like um, not a shame with it, but it's almost like. Oh, don't admit that you've kind of got you do something else as well because it's kind of like this this thing that you're admitting that your your book's maybe not as successful as you want it to be. But the reality of it is that you know the majority of published authors can't make a living from just from their books. You know that's the reality of, isn't it? Yeah, um, and I think it's it's a multi pronged kind of monster because uh, people don't talk about it you know, for kind of shame based, you know, like the reasons you've mentioned, you know, you, you want to think that you've made more of a success of yourself. Um, but then there's also an aspect of you that doesn't want to complain because you should, you feel like you should be grateful that anyone has given you the chance uh, to publish your work anyway. So the last thing you want to do is sound ungrateful by talking about, you know, money that you need to live. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think it's something that people should be talking about and i think that you know, a living wage for writers is is particularly important because then you end up with writers overwhelmingly being people who can afford to write for free yeah um, and that that tends to be people who are already rich yeah well it's a similar thing with uh, across the arts i mean it's the same with acting there's a big debate within drama and acting at the moment for exactly the same reasons because the people that can afford to go without a wage for x number of months or years do tend to be people from a wealthier background or from certain kinds of backgrounds. So as a consequence, you only get, or you're starting to get 
lots and lots of people from the same sort of background. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's why I think it's really good that more people are starting to talk about it. Yeah, for sure, for for definite. So, so you you so you got that uh you know that three book deal, which is as I say, I mean nowadays even established authors that have already had multiple books published, you know, it's often only a two book deal or sometimes only a single book deal or whatever. So that was kind of uh you know, and it wasn't that long ago. So that that was that was kind of a, a bigger big achievement. But were you intimidated or were you still? It was that kind of white hot thing of youth that you still had um I was really intimidated I think um and I was completely unprepared for the amount of work that it was going to take and um yeah my early 20s was really tough it it sounds like it sounds like such a princess thing to moan about no I don't think so because well you know I think I think yeah I think a lot of the writers that are listening to this will know they'll be able to relate to it anyway because we, we, without wanting to, like as you said, or without wanting to sound too moaning about it, but it is very, very difficult to write a novel. Just, it's it's difficult to write any kind of novel, let alone a good novel. Um, <laughs> it takes it takes a lot of work. Um, yeah, you know, with writing, rewriting, editing, and everything else that you have to do. And that's before, if you're going down the traditionally uh, published route, that's before you start looking at submitting the thing and dealing with the rejection and all the other stuff that you have to do. Uh, so no, I don't, I don't think it's kind of a princess thing. I think, I think you're more than justified to do it. And you say, you know, if you split it down into the amount of hours that you spend on a book, even if you write quickly, it's, it's, it's a lot. (laughs) Yeah, it was, it was a lot. Um, and I, but I think it was, I mean, it's amazing one, because I have got, I've got three books out already, uh, that I wouldn't have had out before. Mm -hmm. Um, but it did give me a really valuable, uh, foundation and it was a really steep learning curve in terms of, uh, cultivating discipline. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was the discipline that enabled me to write the fourth one. Mm -hmm. Uh, I wouldn't have been able to sit down and do that. Um, especially in the, in the time that I did it, it only took me about five, five months to write book four. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, that only came about because I had had that pressure, that sustained pressure for years over writing the other three. So do you find, how, how did you, I'm not asking you to give me a really detailed rundown of it because you probably can't remember, but uh, uh, gradually, how do you, how do you think you grew as an author in terms of that discipline and that work ethic? How did that kind of manifest? Obviously, so the first book is like when you make a first album, you know, when a band makes a first album, it's basically all the songs that have been writing ever since they were they were born <laughs> since they were a kid. That sort of everything goes into that first novel usually. And then, as you say, it's almost like starting from scratch for the second, the second or the third book often, not always, but often. Um, so how did you find that journey? Oh, uh, with the second and third ones? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, it is quite hard looking back now because um, I haven't even read them since they came out. <laughs> um, I definitely didn't already have the ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, I mostly came up with, uh, plots and with characters, uh, by just drawing on, uh, people and events around me. Mm-hmm. Um, so in the third novel, I incorporated so many things that I was interested in. And that was when I took probably my first turn towards, um, a little bit of horror, mm-hmm. And, uh, Stephen King inspired kind of ghost stories mm-hmm. um, because I was I was absorbing so many kind of cult uh, sort of folk sort of urban folklore things mm-hmm. like the murder at the Cecile Hotel in Los Angeles mm-hmm. uh, the Cecile Hotel which you know featured in in book three mm-hmm. um, it's called something else now um, and the abandoned insane asylum. Um, in Staten Island, mm-hmm. uh, which I think was called Willowbrook. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I was I I incorporated all of those things into book three because they were things that interested me. Um, but I mean that that was the process through which I basically was thinking on my feet all the time, and also just you know pillaging everything around me in my own life. Yeah, yeah. So well, for people, I mean, we're obviously. We, we, we're talking about it as if people know what these books are, but why don't you tell us a little bit about those first three books, which I think you kind of class as the London Underground series. So tell us about, uh, just give us a bit of a flavour of those, what genre they were and, and how they kind of work as a series. Uh, the first three are very straightforward uh, crime thrillers. Uh, they're set more on the gangland side of things than the police uh, procedural side, uh, mm-hmm. just because that's always interested me more. Mm-hmm. 
Um, the first book, Something You Are, is about a contract killer who uh, develops a fixation on the wife of one of his employers while he's tracking down the um, murderer of their teenage daughter. Um, the second novel is um, all three of them are based in the same universe, um, which is kind of defined by this uh, sex club. Mm hmm. Um, but each book is told from the point of view of a different protagonist. So mm -hmm. the protagonist of the first is a minor character in the second, mm -hmm. and um, all of the books function like that. So everyone's weaving in and out of each other's stories. Yeah. Um, the second book is called Girl 7. Um, mm -hmm. It's about a, uh, a sex worker who turns mercenary against her employer when she's given the opportunity to basically escape her mm -hmm. life in London. Um, and the third book is a uh, is a dual narrative set partly in the US and partly in the UK, and it deals with two uh, British expats on a kind of Kill Bill style road trip mm -hmm. across uh, from the west coast, uh, east coast to the west coast. Um, and it's very pulpy, but the th I, I do enjoy the the third one. I, I thought it was great. Yeah, it sounds like that was good fun to write as well. Yeah, it was fun to research. And I love the kind of, I mean, that I like making that leap to a US mm -hmm. uh, setting as well, because all of the media I, I watch and read is US based. So it felt it felt a lot like home for me. Yeah, well, that would sound, like I say, it sounds like it's good fun. And am I right in thinking that kind of first hand POV, uh, first person POV is kind of, is that your kind of preferred? Uh, yeah, definitely. A third person has always felt a little bit... Um, it just feels a bit odd to me. I, I always think too much about who the narrator is. Mm -hmm. um, and all of my characters arrive with such strong voices. It feels weird to not let them tell it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that, and as you say, in, in Roadkill, it's Roadkill, isn't it, the third book, is it? Oh, yes, Road yeah, Roadkill. So there's two, there's two narratives in that, but again, they're both told from the first person. Yeah. What What is it you like about first person in particular? Um, I just like the process of climbing inside someone's head. Um, mm -hmm. and it becomes, it becomes a process of me getting to know the character as I'm writing as well. And I love that. And I get to see everything through their eyes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and it's quite, it's, it's interesting. You, it's, it intrigues me because it's just being someone else and I get to explore uh, ideas and concepts that I don't understand entirely how I feel about them through how someone else feels about them. Um, I use characters to work out my own thoughts and my own ideas and my own issues quite a lot. Yeah. Um, so I guess it's just a really exaggerated form of empathizing. Mm -hmm. I agree. I, well, I, I, I feel the same. I mean, the, the book that I've just written is in first person and I think it's the same thing. It's kind of almost like it's, becoming an actor and taking on a role almost you can really have fun with it and take it to different places so so on the on that subject of kind of working out things for yourself and getting in the skin of a character so coming back around again to the most recent novel the last um mm -hmm. so obviously that's written in first person and it's a, a journal and as i said at the top of the show it's kind of deals with these you know, some of these quite kind of big ethical dilemmas and things and there was lots of I thought it was really thought provoking in certain places. I'd, you know, I'd stop reading and I'd think about it and I'd think, yeah, what would I do in that situation? And would I really think like that? And, you know, I thought it was really, really good. So, in terms of how you kind of approach that and thinking about what might happen in a kind of end of the world kind of scenario, did you do lots of research about studies <laughs> or anything like that? Or was it literally just pure, vivid imagination, just run with it? Um, I did research up to a point, um, but it's really hard to research something that hasn't happened. Um, so I found myself talking to, I, I talked to a few friends of mine who are scientists and I looked up some, some information online. Um, and the friends of mine who are scientists pretty much said, you know, to all of my questions, which were always things like, you know, would we have the internet here? Mm -hmm. What would happen to, to our electrical sources? And their answers were always, Oh, well, probably, but in some places, maybe not. And I, and I, and I always said, well, well, what dictates where we have electricity, where we have internet and where we don't? And they were like, well, we don't know okay, because, it's, yeah. because it's never happened. Um, so in that sense, I got to take quite a bit of liberty. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose that's, that's the whole point of dystopia, to create a world and play in a world that hasn't quite manifested yet. 
Yeah, and I like uh, the other thing with doing that, particularly with the internet and stuff like that, is you've kind of almost got like this fog of war. So you've set up what is obviously a huge world changing global event, but you're focusing on a relatively small cast of characters and this small, a smaller world that you've created. And because of the internet's down and all that kind of stuff, you know, what's going on around them and around the world is kind of very, at least for a large portion of the novel, is kind of very difficult to discern, isn't it? Yeah, and I, I enjoyed that because um, one of the things that entertained me most about writing the novel was just the recurring obsession with the internet mm. um, and how we, we rely on it for everything now. Like, we don't even... I mean, newspapers seem almost an antiquated way of of absorbing news because yeah. you don't you don't wait until you go out and buy a paper and then you read about what's taken place in the last few days. By the time you're reading it, it's outdated. Mm-hmm. And like a thousand other things have happened, and Twitter's talking about them. Um, and the way I think we we engage with the larger world now, it's at a breakneck pace compared to how people used to engage with it. And if that was, if, if one day we couldn't access that, I think it would have a massive psychological fallout. I agree. Yeah. I mean, uh, and again, that was something that was it really came across strongly in the novel, because as you say, uh, because, you know, anytime anybody gets any kind of access to either power or the possible internet data or whatever, they are desperate to, and it's understandable for the various reasons because they want to contact their loved ones and all that kind of thing. But we do, you know, if you think about it now, we talk about people being screen zombies and all that kind of thing and people walking around with their, their, their phones in their hand pretty much all the time. And the <laughs> thought of not being able to, you know, and it being dead. I mean, we, as you say, we we panic if we go somewhere and there's not Wi-Fi or there's, there's no 4G or whatever at the moment. So, you know, for half an hour, an hour or something, so... It would have. Yeah, it. exactly. Like yeah. even at the point that you said that, I realised that I had picked up my phone and was just <laughs> flashing my emails out of habit. And I just thought, no, just put it down, just put it down, it damn is, it. It is, it is. And it is a lot of it is habit. And I think, uh, I mean, I know there's like a wider debate about this at the moment and a lot of uh, the phone manufacturers are trying to kind of head it off at the past before they kind of get regulation or whatever, but there's screen time and different bits and pieces that tell you. But it it, it, it is so addictive um and habit forming i mean standing in a queue if you've got like 30 seconds where you're waiting in a queue or you're waiting for something else to happen as you say you automatically take your phone out you check your email or you check your twitter feed or your facebook or whatever it is that you're that you're into um and so yeah so something like this and it's forcing people to kind of uh get their kind of worldview from what's actually happening around them, immediately around them in the case of your book. Yeah, yeah. And and in terms of like the kind of ethical dilemmas and different bits and pieces, and I, and I don't want to give any kind of spoilers or anything like that, obviously for the novel, but there are certain points. Did you, I mean, have you got any background with like philosophy or anything like that? Or did you speak to it? Or was it just a case of you just, again, you just thought things through and you approached it as you thought the characters might approach it? Um, a bit of both. I mean, it's not as if I have any formal educational background in uh, philosophy or anything like that, but I mostly uh, read nonfiction. So it's something it's something I spend so much time thinking about anyway. And um, the reason I found John very interesting as a character is because he's a person who, you know, his whole life he has been very concerned with looking like a good person mm-hmm. and coming cross as a good person in everything that he does when you know in a lot of ways he actually isn't Mm -hmm. um and what this kind of cataclysmic event has to bring out of him is having to do the good deeds as well as just talking a good talk um he has to find it in himself to be brave and to think about how he relates to other people and how he treats other people um and it was really interesting watching him do that (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And the fact that you took on um, a male... I mean, I haven't read your, your your other novels, so I don't know whether you've probably got male characters in your other novels. I, I don't know. But in terms of how do you find that, the kind of gender reversal, do you, do you is that something that you enjoy? I mean, how do you approach that? Um, well, every... I mean, every character is different. And I suppose it only becomes an issue if you try and treat it like it doesn't matter. So, I mean, gender is going to be a massive factor in how people conduct themselves at the end of the world, because I mean, one of the reasons I touched upon sexual assault, mm-hmm. um, it, like issues of sexual assault in the novel, 
um, is because women would be overwhelmingly dealing with that. Um, and it's not an aspect of the apocalypse that men tend to worry about. They don't think, oh, God, the world's ended. You know, if, if a breakdown in civilization happened, we would have to deal with so much more rape. Like men, men are not really going to think that. No. Um, whereas I think if you talk to a lot of women about the end of the world, um, I mean, it's going to come up as a as a like a worrying subject mm -hmm. because it's something that we deal with in the kind of dystopian parallel universe that we already live in. Mm -hmm. um, and that would only be exacerbated by disastrous or ap apocalyptic situations. Um, so I think, I mean, I, I enjoy writing from the perspective of, you know, men and the perspective of women, but I think y it would be disingenuous to do that thing where, uh, you know, there's that method where you write a character as a man and then you switch them to a woman at right, the end. Yeah, yeah. I kind of don't believe in doing that because no, we I agree. have different worries and we do have uh, views on things that are informed by our gender experience. Yeah. Do you kind of have, like, as regards, not just with writing a, a male character or whatever, but in general with your books, do you use beta readers? Have you kind of got people that you let see your work before you send it for submission or anything like that? Um, it had been read by a few people. I, I'm not, I, I don't have any sort of dedicated team of beta readers or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't tend to let people read um, the novel until it's finished or, or any piece of work of mine until it's finished. Mm -hmm. um, but what I do, um, I do do a lot of is just research into uh, where I might fall down while, while writing from my limited perspective. Mm -hmm. So just being aware that, you know, I am a woman, but I'm also white. Um, oh, yeah. And, I, you know, I and that's going to limit my experience. And it it could mean that I write something uh, stereotypical or just, you know, just lazy, like mm -hmm. without realizing that I have. Mm -hmm. So um, I do a lot of reading um, of like blog posts that specifically like tell people um things to look out for in their own writing so I, I think i've become much better at self-editing in that way mm -hmm. um, and it was interesting like during the editing process um, i noticed that just because i uh, I, I mentioned the race of a, a few characters um i had an editing note that said you know why is john obsessed with race <laughs> right and i and i thought well you know that there's definitely a a sort of slant in it where he he definitely fetishizes black women to a certain extent, yeah. um, and that's deliberate in the creation of his character. But that wasn't you know about that. That was about you know him just remarking upon the race of other people in order to describe them accurately. Um, and I thought it was interesting that that was picked up upon as you know John being obsessed with race, just just describing how people look, and they weren't white. Yeah, I think that, and I think that's fair to say. And I think it's probably more of an issue again with the first person thing because you know depending on what your character's background is 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 going to depend on how they describe somebody yeah absolutely um and i spend a lot of time and um, probably way too much time in uh in like workshops and uh like any talks and stuff talking about um the writer's capacity to do harm and about the amount of research and sensitivity you should put into uh portraying other people's experiences who aren't yours um so you know, it's something that's always been a massive concern of mine. I think I think writers should be much more worried than we are about our capacity to portray people stereotypically and our capacity to like perpetuate, um, you know, stereotypes and do harm. OK, I want to take a quick break there to remind you to do a couple of things which would be really helpful. So as you know, the show is free and it'll continue to be free for as long as I can keep finding great guests to chat to and for as long as you loyal listeners continue to tune in and bother to listen. But there are a couple of things you can do to support the show and help me to continue improving things and widening my audience. So firstly, very simple, share the show with at least one new person a week or a month or whenever you think to do, but just tell them. Find another writer or a creative or whoever might be interested in what we're talking about here that enjoys hearing inspirational interviews with like-minded people and just tell them about the show. Tell them in person, drop them an email, share the show on social media, I don't care, but they're much more likely to take notice of you rather than the host of yet another interview-based writing podcast. Um, secondly, if you haven't done so already... Then I thank you if you have, by the way. But leave me an iTunes rating and review. It costs you nothing. 
but it makes a huge difference to how many people can find the show. And if you do that, drop me a line or tweet to let me know and I'll be sure to give you a mention and, of course, my undying gratitude. Thirdly, join the newsletter or mailing list or whatever you want to call it. You can find that in the show notes or go to joinedupwriting.co.uk and click on join the mailing list. Again, it's totally free. I don't spam or share your information with anyone else. And I only ask for your name and your email address. You'll get an email every time I post any new content, whether that's a show or it's a blog post. But you'll also it'll also mean that you're the first to hear about any bonus stuff I put out. And just by signing up, you'll get an inspirational tips poster and a three act story structure template and there'll be more stuff coming soon so sign up it takes seconds and finally don't forget the show is sponsored by audible which i love and have subscribed to for the past three years audiobooks are brilliant and i've listened to dozens of amazing fiction and non-fiction books that have inspired informed and entertained me and as a listener you get a 30-day free trial i do remind you at the beginning of each show but i can understand that that just becomes like wallpaper after a while uh, but if you sign up for that that trial, I'll get a couple of pennies, literally, if you give it a go. So it's another free way to support the show, and you get to check out Audible, which I think is brilliant. So just go to audibletrial.com forward slash joined up. Again, it's in the show notes. Right, no more hard sell. Let's get back to my chat with Hannah, where I asked her about her recent foray into screenwriting. Am I right in thinking that you also write screenplays? Um, I have I have been for the last uh, year. Um, it's not a project I can talk about yet. Mm-hmm. Um, but but yes, I have been um, going through the painstaking process of teaching myself to screenwrite for the last <laughs> for the last year to two years. Well, I was going to ask you about that. What what kind of prompted that? I know you can't talk about the specific pro- project, but what prompted you to want to get into that? And uh, you know, you, as you say, you're kind of teaching yourself how to do it as you go along but what do you enjoy about it and are there any kind of crossover or lessons that you can transfer from your skills as a novelist um i think what i mean what attracted me to screenwriting is is just loving tv um i i love tv i watch it all the time i i consume it voraciously and i analyze it to death Mm -hmm. um and I, i i just love it beyond all reason and um even while writing my first novels, so many of my prime primary sort of inspirations um, are TV shows, mm-hmm. um, and they they always have been. Um, so I've always wanted to to write something that enables me to to participate in that. And I I, I love dialogue. Even 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 in my novels, they're so dialogue driven. Mm, I like dialogue. Uh, like right right back to book one, and pe- people have always commented like they find it very filmic or that mm-hmm. it's very to see in their heads as a as a scene from a tv show mm-hmm. um even even to the point where i've had to go back and edit scenes to to write more description and remind myself to you know engage with prose instead of just making everything a back and forth conversation yeah um and i think t- tv lends itself to that i love writing how people talk um and in terms of like bringing skills back i think tv gives you a control over timing um like how to time scenes like where to how to construct suspense i mean screenwriting is so dictated by structure like Mm -hmm. even down to you know it's like you know roughly a page a minute or something like Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. and once you've got a handle on it it, it's amazing going back and writing a chapter in the same way and thinking about sort of coming that whole thing about you come in late and you get out early that sort of thing where does the scene need to start and where does it where would be a good place to finish it sort of thing yeah, and and I've always seen novels in my head as a TV show or a film anyway. So it just it it makes it feel like a much more active process rather than just you know hallucinating and, and ch- channeling <laughs> whatever whatever's there onto the page. Um, it feels like it feels like a something I can actually uh, cultivate in a disciplined way. Well, I, I'm a firm believer anyway. Even if people aren't going to write, they don't particularly have plans to write. Uh, screenplays or scripts or whatever i'm a firm believer in looking at the way that scripts and screenplays are structured because i think there's loads to learn for novelists anyway i think it, i i agree i think it, there, there's loads of great lessons to learn in there particularly with building scenes lots of people struggle with dialogue anyway so it's you know it's a good way to kind of practice that so i think there's lots to be gained from from trying that 
Yeah, I've um, I've I've said for ages that if I was to teach a, a sort of uni course, it would uh, it would be character construction using the TV show Justified. Oh as yeah, yeah. Summary. I, I could I could wax lyrical about that for weeks because and I tell I tell everyone to go away and watch it if you want to learn how to write characters consistently go and watch the first three or maybe four seasons of Justified and look at how they construct character and about how uh, they drop clues in the dialogue specifically I think it's genius like absolutely genius writing and it can only be useful to novel to novelists yeah, absolutely. Well, well, on that kind of subject of writing advice, and as we sort of move towards the end of the conversation, so what would you say is the best piece of writing advice you ever heard, and what's the worst? Oh, the best <laughs> and the worst. Oh, it's going to be really hard to say the worst without that being some sort of public call. <laughs> You don't have to say who gave it to you, but you you know, you could say, oh, and when I say the worst, it might not be, it just might be something that you personally disagree with or something that doesn't work for you or that maybe, you know, you tried and it was just not for you. That's, you know, you don't have to out somebody as a terrible, (laughs) terrible writing tutor or whatever. I'm sure, I'm sure like, like having a nemesis can only be really good for someone's career. (laughs) Um, Absolutely. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, let me think of the best. Well, the best, the best writing advice. I'm not sure who actually gave it to me, um, or wh- or whether it's just something I've picked up. Oh mm. God, it might even be my own advice. That's okay. That's all right. People can benefit from it. Yeah, it, the only piece of writing advice I've really found useful is sit down and just finish the damn thing. Mm-hmm. Um, or the way that oh, my friend puts it in a really good way because he's scouse. He just said you've got to sit down and fill your ass. <laughs> He just said, you've got, to sit, you've got to really feel your ass. You've got to sit down and get the thing finished. And there's no magic workaround for that. Like everything else is just ritual and superstition. Mm-hmm. Like what you actually need to do is sit down and finish your projects. And that is going to take hours and it's going to be incredibly painful. Um, it's going to have a few brief highs, um, but it's going to be a really exhausting process. Um, but you have to do it. If you're serious about it and you want to write. Yeah, exactly. Like there's no there's no way to not sit down and put the hours in. Um, so I think finish your projects, just finish them um, is the best piece of advice because it's actually the most applicable and the most practical. The worst, I, I don't know, I can't think of a specific piece of writing advice, which is terrible, but I think anything that's just too prescriptive. Uh-huh. Um, I think the way a lot of writers, and I, I genuinely don't mean any in particular, uh-huh. um, give writing advice is very much, uh, oh, this has worked for me, so so don't do this. It's you know, yeah, it, it implies that it's somehow a universal experience, and what's worked for them is is what's going to work for everyone. When when in reality, we all have these really weird. Um, distinct roads that we've taken to publication mm-hmm. um, and so much of it is just luck um, and it's stuff that you can't plan for at all um, so I think most most writing advice is pretty much finish your projects plus a load of common sense yeah yeah well that's pretty good um, that's pretty good advice it's practical and it's obviously served you well <laughs> yeah I guess I guess so yeah um, so, the only but- other piece of writing advice that's really profoundly affected how I work was I'm um, actually in a piece written by Joss Whedon mm-hmm. um, and it was in a piece called how to be prolific and uh, and one of his uh, pieces of writing advice was eat dessert first um, <laughs> right. and sometimes that's that's literally I do believe in the reward yourself uh, with food for having an idea or writing a good paragraph like uh-huh. yeah go away and have a have a you know pastry or a coffee or something because uh-huh. God, we we need the encouragement um but like eat dessert first is just write the scene that you are excited about first. Like don't don't chain yourself to writing everything sequentially. And I used to do that because I used to have this really masochistic mindset of, oh, if I can get through all of this, all of this scene that I don't care about, I could get to this exciting bit. And I'll eat all my Brussels sprouts first. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It true. It truly is that. Mm-hmm. And as soon as I stopped doing that, writing became easier and the way um joss whedon described it is um by the time that you reach you know the middle of the project where you're feeling tired you're months into it you're too far in to quit but you're not far enough in to feel good about finishing that what's going to get you through that time is having a project that you're already passionate about 
And it's going to be a project that's made up of your favorite parts. So I think if you've got a scene in your head that you love and that you desperately have to put down, like put it down, whether it's the ending or not, like just just write it down. I love that advice, actually. And it is something that I am definitely uh, guilty of of not following. (laughs) That's a really bad (laughs) way of putting it. But uh, yeah, I often I, I think to myself, oh, yeah, I know I've got that scene. Uh, that's coming up later in the book, and I, you know, and, and what I need to do now is I need to write my way. You know, my my incentive now is I need to write my way to that scene, and yeah, then I can write that scene. Yeah, and and the other the other thing with it is, well, is sometimes, you know, I I've written that amazing scene that I love, and then because I'm tends to, tend to pants everything, and I don't tend to plot things <laughs> in any great detail. I then find when I get to the the scene, uh, I've gone, I've you know, the the plot's taken a different a different turn and that scene's no longer relevant but i completely agree i think the key to it is finding those scenes and using them as stepping stones um you know those scenes that you're really really passionate about or that you enjoyed the ones where you do actually enjoy them as you're writing them because you don't always enjoy everything as you're writing it do you it's more like having written it's sort of getting to the side yeah i think it's it is definitely a balance between scenes that you just you love and you feel like you're in them and they're so immediate and so emotionally involving. And then, you know, it's the days where you think, well, I've written, you know, I've hit my word count today and, it, and it's good. I don't hate it. And that, you know, that's a different kind of achievement. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that, I think all of that is really, really good, uh, good advice and really, really useful. So, so what's up next? Obviously you, the, the last is, um, uh, well, as this podcast goes out, it, I think the last will be out. What's the actual date of release? It's out on the thirty uh, first of January. Okay, right. So I think this this podcast actually goes out sort of two days before. So by the time people are listening to this, they'll pretty much be able to uh, buy the last. And I would definitely recommend that they do that. Um, and what's what's up next? Can you talk about that? Um, well, I'm working. I mean, I'm a, I'm working on a, a TV series, uh-huh. um, which I'm really excited about. I can say that it's a historical drama, so it's nothing that I've uh, like what I've written before. Oh, brilliant! So I'll still be working on that, and I've also started book five. Um, at the moment I'm exactly two thousand words into it, <laughs> um, and it's it's similar in tone. It's definitely going to be a kind of J.G. Ballard style dystopia in the in the same way that I hope the the last is. Brilliant. Um, so yeah, that's that's going to be me for the next six months or whatever. <laughs> Excellent, something to look forward to. So, where can people find more about you and your work online and follow you on social media, etc.? Um. Oh God, Twitter, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> find me on Twitter, that horrible place. Um. But yeah, it's probably where I do the most. Um. I can I use the word shit posting? Yeah, like, you can shit post. Will that yeah. be edited out. Yeah. No, that's okay. <laughs> Um, I used the word titted earlier. I was wondering if that was going to make it in. Um, titted. Um, uh, yes, if you if if you want to find out more about me, um, then yeah, I guess follow me on Twitter um, or Instagram, where it's happier. <laughs> You've got the two sides of your personality. Yeah, yeah. And where and and where? What's your Twitter handle and your Instagram? Can you remember those? Uh, my Twitter handle is uh, Hannah without an h on the end uh hannah underscore jameson and my instagram handle is uh hannah nino jameson brilliant and i'll put that in the show notes as well so people will be able to click through and check out what you're up to but for now thanks a million hannah it's really good to chat to you okay no worries (laughs) thanks for having me Okay, thanks again to Hannah Jameson, and you can buy The Last right now in all the usual places. I'll put Hannah's links in the show notes over at joinedupwriting.co.uk. That wraps things up for another week, but don't forget you can find the entire back catalogue of interviews on the website. Make sure that you do subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Overcast, or wherever else you get your podcasts to have the show downloaded automatically every week. Next time, I'll be talking to American author Lillian Lee about her debut novel, Number One one Chinese restaurant. Until then, thanks for listening. I'm Wayne Kelly. Happy writing and reading, and I'll see you next time. Joined up.